Hello, Heart of the World. Welcome to chapter 24 of the story. So good to see you today. Uh, thank you for being here. I so appreciate the fact that you value community. You're valuing God's word. And I know as you plant this seed, it will not return void. Just excited to be here and sharing with you. As we mentioned on Sunday, uh, Jesus just did amazing things. And if you read your chapter, you just see miracles all over the place. And just one of the things that really stuck out to me about the chapter was that Jesus came to bring a new way of living, a new culture, a new kingdom. And um, as we just consider the word culture, have you ever been in a doctor's office that is just chaos? You know, usually when you go in a place, you know the culture right away. What my wife and I, we went into a, a eye doctor's office and there was like 30 patients waiting. And immediately we knew, okay, the culture of this office is let's see as many patients as possible and we don't care how long the patients have to wait. And we waited five hours to see the doctor. You go in another doctor's office, there's four patients and you get in. There's a, there's a culture in every environment. There's a culture here today in your life group. There, there's a way of living. We, dis, we defined culture, just a definition, is, is a way of living, a way we do life. And, and we often become oblivious to the cultures we're in. Every family has a culture. Every job place has a culture. Every school has a culture. Every church has a culture. And as you enter that culture and as you live in that culture, you, you become unaware of, of the culture. Um, church has been influenced by culture. Church influences culture, but church gets influenced by culture. Uh, the days of the week, our holidays, Christmas and, and Easter, you know, they were influenced by culture. The fact that we recognize those holidays is good. But just the name Easter, you know, that was, that was a, a heathen festival, a worship of a, of a Germanic goddess, the name Eoster. It was their culture that then uh, got spread to the whole world that we call Resurrection Day Easter. So culture, it's just a big deal. You know, I can tell the culture of your home when I walk in. You can tell a lot. You know, this, this family values cleanliness. Their home is immaculate. Or this family val doesn't value cleanliness. There's toys everywhere and it's chaos. And you know what value uh, the family has when you walk in there. Their kids speak re respectfully, yes sir, yes ma'am, or their kids are throwing tantrums because they don't listen to their parents at all. There's a culture, there's a way of living. And what is culture? Culture, every culture has a set of values. You know, the way I described it Sunday was every culture has a value system. What's important? What's important? What's important to you? And maybe just think about that for a second. What's important in your life? What do you value the most? Do you value family? Do you value entertainment, your own time alone? Do you value food? Do you value um, your work? I mean, what are, what are the things that are important to you? Do you value God? Obviously you do because you're here. But what are things that are important? Culture has a, a, a system of values and every culture places some things higher and some things lower. Um, some things are important and some things are not. And every culture, because they value things, they produce fruit. And um, whether good or bad, in our, in our country we see a value of, of relativism, a value of you believe what you want to believe, I believe what I want to believe. Don't you tell me the way I should live. And that culture is producing fruit. You have people now today that don't even know right from wrong. They're, they're so blinded, their heart is so hard that they believe that it's okay, for example, to kill unborn babies, you know? That, that it's perfectly justified. There's all sorts of examples of ways of thinking that lead to deception. And so Jesus shows up on the scene and he's bringing a new culture. He says, hey, the value system of the world, it's, it's false. It's, it's just a trap. It leads to nowhere. In fact, it leads to death. And I've come 
to bring a new culture, to bring a new kingdom. And in the sermon, I described it as the right side up culture and the upside down culture. The right side up culture, we read in Luke 6, 24 through 26, we read that the world values power and comfort and success and recognition. And Jesus came and he says in verse 20 to 23, he says, actually it's the opposite. If you want to change the world, if you want to know what leads to life, if you want to know what leads to the fullness of life, it's the opposite. It's humility. It's blessed are the poor and blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, blessed are those who mourn. Uh, blessed are those who are rejected and persecuted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus is saying, hey, the way I want to live and the way I want to call you to live is the opposite of the world value system. Because the world and what we see every day, the world we live in, is very temporary. It's, it's not the real story. The real story is that there is, a, there is a, the kingdom of light and there's the kingdom of darkness. There is a spiritual battle going on for every person's soul, for their spirit to either receive eternal glory or eternal damnation. And Jesus just says, hey, temporary comfort, the world's comfort, it's, it's okay. I created good things. I created you to enjoy life. But there's more to life than that. And I care about people so much that I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to lay down my life so that they can know me. They can be part of my family. Some examples of, of cult, the cultural clash. You know, what happens when you show up at home and you've had a hard day and your wife has had a hard day and the kids are just going crazy. Dinner's not made and everyone's just done. <laughs> and you get a call from your buddy that says, hey, uh, we're going to Farley's and we're gonna watch the game. You wanna come grab a bite with us? And you look at your wife and she gives you that look like, don't you dare. <laughs> your choice is, which culture am I gonna be part of? Am I gonna be part of the world's culture that says, hey, I'm living for my own comfort. I deserve this break with my buddies. Are you going to be part of the kingdom culture that says, hey, husbands, serve your wife. Put her ahead of you. Be willing to lay down your life. Don't just be willing to die for her. Be willing to make dinner for her. It's a cult. Which culture are you part of? Or when you have a disagreement with someone and, and you have an argument, the culture of the world would then turn around and go gossip about that person or get revenge towards that person or just pretend just ignore that person, just write them off. But in the kingdom culture, we would go and we would have a conversation. We wouldn't go talk to anyone else about it, but we would talk to that person and try to resolve our disagreement. Or what about if God asked you to give financially? There's this need, there's this person that's hurting, or the church has this need, and God's saying, hey, would you give? Maybe give away your vacation money to help. Which culture are you part of? Are you part of the culture that says, what's mine is mine and I'm keeping my money and I'm keeping my vacation? Or what's mine is God's and if he asks me to give, I'm gonna give and I'm gonna believe that he's gonna bless me more than I could ask or think. There's a cultural battle every day. Every day we, can, we often think of it at a macro level, what's happening in our country or our state, but every day you're in a culture battle. Are you going to live for the kingdom? Or are you going to live according to the world's value? And so Jesus came and he said, hey, I'm going to give you the power. I'm giving you the power to influence and affect the culture. The Bible says to pray, not my will, but your will be done. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're supposed to believe that heaven can come. As we partner with God's culture, as we say yes to the kingdom culture, God gives us power to make decisions and to, to be able to, to do things that we couldn't do ourselves. He would give us the faith to believe that someone could be healed. He would give us the financial resource to help even when we may not have the resource. 
We release heaven on earth. Everywhere Jesus went, he was healing people. He was doing miracles. People were being f set free from, from demon possession, from blindness, from deafness, from leprosy, from death itself. The power of God was in Jesus as he modeled these kingdom values of humility and sacrifice and exclusion. He was the most powerful person, even though people despised him and ultimately he gave his life. He was the most powerful person that ever lived. And Jesus is wanting you to be a powerful person. Even in your loss, you can have great power. You can have great influence in the kingdom culture. And so how, do, how did Jesus influence culture? He knew his purpose. He knew that he was here to save that which was lost. What is your purpose? What is your purpose at school? What's the value system at your job? Just, just sit back and think about what do people at work value? Do you see people valuing power? Do you fee see people valuing recognition? They want to be more important. Or they don't, you know, they talk about what's wrong with these other people. You could, if you just sit back and think about what's at play at work, what purpose could you have there? What, what value system could you bring there at work? Jesus knew his purpose. He wasn't influenced by the political culture or the financial culture or the religious culture. He was operating within the context of those cultures, and yet because he knew his purpose, they didn't define him. He didn't let his employer define who he was going to be. He didn't let his family define who he was going to be. He didn't let his lack of money define who he was going to be. He let his purpose define him. And God has a purpose for you and your life and your family in every area of your life. And that is to love God and love people and to seek that which was lost. To see that you're in a spiritual war, not, not a battle with flesh and blood. The people at work are not your enemy, and as long as you see them as your enemy, you'll miss out on the purpose that God has for you at your work. The pe your professors, your pe the people at school, they're not your enemy. And until you see that God has a purpose for their life, you'll miss out on your purpose in that place. Jesus knew his purpose. He knew and he, he was connected with his Father. Every day, Jesus was intentional about understanding how the Father wanted him to carry out his purpose for that day. And Jesus was never stressed out about time. He was never worried about missing an appointment or not healing someone that had asked to be healed. He never was worried about not meeting the right person or not having the right connections or the right network. He never, he never stressed out about that because he was connected with his Father who had unlimited resources. And if you're feeling stressed today about time, about money, about what you don't have, then I want to encourage you today. It's not about what you don't have. It's about what God has for you. And as you connect with the Father, He has unlimited resources. He has everything you need. And last, Jesus went and He met needs. He met the deepest needs. And often we pray about our wants. God, I want a new house. Or God, I want uh, my kids to act <laughs> appropriately in public. Or um, I want this promotion. And Jesus, of course, he hears our wants. And he says to pray about those things. But Jesus is so much more interested in our needs. He knows what we need at the deepest level of our spirit, of our heart, of our mind, our emotions. He knows it. And everywhere he went, Jesus was meeting needs. He was meeting needs of the woman who was bleeding for 12 years. Her biggest need wasn't to be healed from bleeding. Her biggest need was to be recognized as a daughter. He told her, your faith has healed you. He, he was saying, hey, I recognize you. you. You can be part of my family. I'm setting the course of your destiny. You're not just a woman who's healed from bleeding. You're a woman who's been healed from an identity as an outsider, an outcast, unclean. I'm healing that part of you. Jesus came to meet needs. And church, I want to challenge all of us today. 
many of us has, have accepted a lower, um, a lower standard or a lower anointing a lower expectation of what God has for our life. God has so much more for us. He's called us to influence the world, not for the world to influence us. And I have to admit, I let the world influence me. Many times, many times I think about what I don't have, what I lack. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough of whatever. But God is wanting us to influence our culture. He's wanting to take the upside down kingdom to the world. And it will create a reaction. People, some people will hate you because of Jesus. And the Bible says to count it all joy. But some people will be so melted by the fact that Jesus loves them. And for those people, it will be so worth the sacrifice, the cost of being intentional, of not just living today because it's another day, but living today on purpose connected with your Father, and asking God how He wants to meet needs of the people in your life. So Lord, I just pray for your people today. I pray for all of us that we would walk with an awareness and with the power of the kingdom culture, that we would expect you to move powerfully today, even in this moment, that we would see heaven come to our group that we would see you release miracles and that we would take what you want to give us to our communities. And so, Lord, just bless each one today. Just encourage them. Fill them with your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great discussion. We'll see you next time.